But we've got to understand how to engage. If we're in a tipping point moment, if we're going to see a nation change, it's getting worse instead of better, guys. We've got to press in. I believe that God's given us spiritual weapons that enable us to engage in the midst of this process. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus said this. Oh, it says this about Jesus. It says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest. Are you reading that scripture? For this purpose. It doesn't say to save souls, to heal the sick, or to cast out devils, although he did all of that. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest, read it with me, that he might destroy the works of the enemy. Everything he did was an act of spiritual warfare. Everything Jesus did was an expression of the love of the Father, but an act of spiritual warfare. And I know a lot of people say, well, we don't need to do spiritual warfare because Jesus already won it all for us. But let me just say this. How many know that Jesus died so that whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved? Do you believe that if you believe in Jesus, the work that he accomplished on the cross is enough to save every single person on this planet if they call on the name of the Lord? Do you believe that? So we have to preach the gospel, and what we're doing when we're doing that is we're taking what he has accomplished, we are pulling it out of just this accomplished realm into a place of practically impacting the hearts and the lives of people. In other words, it's a, it is an accomplished work, but it's got to continue to be preached and it's got to continue to be applied so that people can break through into salvation. That's why we have the responsibility to win souls. Yes, Jesus accomplished the work of defeating the devil when he hung on the cross. But um, I love Robert Gay's analogy. Um, he, he uses this analogy in his book, Silencing the Enemy. He says, it's like we're in a big courtroom and God is the judge. And, um, and, the ju and, the, and the enemy, the devil, is the criminal. And the judge bangs his gavel and pronounces sentence. Okay, I'm sentencing you to eternity in the lake of fire. Or I'm sentencing you to be bound. I'm sentencing you to not have authority over those people's lives. Okay? But we are the bailiff. Because you know what? When a criminal gets sentenced, he doesn't just go, okay, judge, okay, take me away. Right? Somebody's got to be there to enforce the judgment that the judge has just released. Look at this in Psalms 149. It says, let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand to bind kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the written judgment. This honor, honor, have all his saints. So we are God's heavenly bailiff that where we see the enemy trespassing or we see the enemy attacking or we see the enemy coming and robbing, stealing, and killing, destroying, we, it is our job to enforce the victory that Jesus won on the cross and to go and tell him, nope, you're defeated foe. You don't have authority. I take your authority. I strip your authority and I set the captives free. You see, we've got to get a different mentality. In, in Israel, every male and female citizen, when they reach a certain age, go through military training. Do you realize that? Every adult knows how to handle a weapon. Every home has weapons in it to defend themselves, because you know they've been invaded. So every man and woman of an adult age are trained to be a part of the army. But see, in America, you join the military or you're a civilian. How many former military people? We've got a lot of former military people, okay? Let's give them a hand, amen? We appreciate you guys. But so here's how we think. Over in Israel, when war comes, everybody goes to get their weapon. In America, when war comes, we pray for the military. But we stay civilians. We've got a civilian mentality. Come on, we'll, we'll pray for that. And in the church, we think it's the intercessor's job. We think it's the deliverance team job. We think it's the leadership's job. But the rest of us want to just be civilians. 
When what the truth is, is that every single one of us need to have weapons in our home that we know how to use. The enemy comes knocking on your door that it's not just a matter of calling the pastor. Now, you can call the pastor or you can call one of your leaders to pray with you, but we ought to know how to defend our own homes, defend our own families, defend our own stuff because we've become skilled in the use of our spiritual weapons and not have a civilian mentality. Oh, the devil's attacking me. I've got to go find somebody that knows how to use their weapon. Come on. Of course, I'm talking to Americans. You probably all have weapons in your home anyway. But do you hear what I'm saying? We've got to understand that God is looking at the entire church and saying, I need you to be my ecclesia. So I want to just, I want to read you the scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, just to bring this some clarity when I'm talking about weapons. It says, for though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. How many know Apostle Tom talked about how there's different battlegrounds and one of the battlegrounds is our own mind, right? Put your hand on your head. Come on, we got to get our minds redeemed. That's why we're in this Bible study about waging war uh, and winning the battle in our minds, okay? But it's not just in our minds. We got to understand that it's out there as well. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready, say I'm ready, to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So if you'll think about this tipping point again, and we're going to just talk about a few of the weapons just real quickly because I think that we need to understand what we already have at our disposal. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to learn how to lift using our spiritual weapons of prayer and praise. I should be preaching to the choir today, but let me just say this. I have actually found that even in our circles and even in our church, people think they pray and they don't pray. Do you know you actually have to engage in prayer? It can't just be a hopeful thought, a wishful thought. I wish God would do this for me. No, you've got to actually engage in conversation with prayer. You've got to actually open up your mouth and let words come out. Well, God didn't do this for me. Well, did you pray about it? Well, I thought about it. No, that's not good enough. Listen, you can't do anything more but pray until you prayed. (laughs) Let me say that again. Pastor, pray for me. Dr. Chuck, counsel me. Bishop, lay hands on me. All that's good. But God's saying, where's your weapon of prayer? Are you personally engaging in prayer? Are you asking God to bless your family? Are you warring over your prodigal child? Are you contending for your business? Come on. Are you believing God and making uh, declarations and praying about your own health? Come on. This is spiritual engagement. And I know that I'm talking to people that know this, but are we doing it? (laughs) 